So it's time. Uh, I will say hey and welcome. Hi and welcome uh, to this installation lecture that uh, Professor René Laufer uh, is going to hold in the subject space system. I think he will soon just present himself if he want to and <laughs> like that. Uh, so it will be uh, Correct. Uh, I'm going to share this uh, session today and I am Lena Abrahamsson. I'm Dean of the Faculty of Science and uh, uh, Technology here at LTU, Luleå University of Technology. Uh, for those who have not been on an installation lecture, I would say a little bit what it is. It's lectures that are held by all new professors. They are lectures that we learn something basic of the research area and we also learn some of the state of the art in the field. Uh, and uh, as you probably know, these lectures, installation lectures, they are holding connection to the big academic ceremony where the new professors are installed and received uh, the diploma. And this will be on Saturday. So we are quite busy at university for a moment. So it's party time for us. But uh, today, it's, this is part of the party, but it's also quite serious. Uh, so we look forward to listen to uh, your presentation. How far is it from Norrbotten to space? And that I would very much like to listen to you. Uh, and we have, uh, it, it, it will be something about why Norrbotten is a space place uh, and where we have space activities right now, quite a lot interesting. And uh, we will see what will happen in the future as well. So we, it's a in very interesting area of research at L LTU. So, René, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction. So, welcome here from Luleå, uh, those who are here on site and those who are somewhere out there and participate online in this event. So the question is, how far is it from Norbotten to space. So let's ask around because this will be an interactive lecture. So how far is it from Norbotten to space? What would you think? Make a guess. Short distance. Well, a meter, a few hundred meters, a few kilometers. Huh? Some nanometers. Some nanometers. And you? Kilometers. Okay, so we have a few nanometers, a few thousand kilometers, 36,000, very good. So if you give answers, you get chocolate. So this is the deal. Anyone else who wants to give an answer, what would you guess? How far is it from Norbotten to space? En mil. So 10 kilometers, I learned, being new in Sweden. Huh? Three mil. Three mil. So 30 kilometers. Very good. Can you catch? Can. Yes. Thank you. So let's ask somebody else who is... 200 kilometers. Okay, so we keep these numbers in mind. You came in last, so what would you think is the distance from Norbotten to space? Just make an educated guess. Okay, so we have an I don't know answer. Lena, what is your guess? Zero. Okay, that's also not bad. <laughs> so we, we have very, very different opinions and very, very different answers. So before we answer that at the end, the question is allowed then, does it actually matter how far it is from Norbotten to space? Because is Norbotten actually a space place? What would you think? Is Norbotten a space place? Yes, very much so. Why is Norbotten a space place? So space? We are so close to space. That is a very beautiful answer. Tina, what do you think? Is Norbotten a space place? Of course. Why? It is closer to space than everywhere, everywhere else, right? Maybe not everywhere. <laughs> so, Norbotten is a space place for quite a while. You might not realize that. Because doing things with space didn't start in 1957 when the first satellite was launched into space. Actually, looking up to the sky is probably one of the oldest sciences we have, astronomy. And people were looking up to the sky for thousands of years. And this is the documented part. Let's assume that when humans started to walk, or even before, 
They probably looked up to the sky and wondered about what the stars are about. Why is this shape and the size and maybe even features of this other object that seems to be close, the moon changing? So all these questions probably came up hundreds of thousands of years ago. But when it comes to systematic research, of course, then it is, might be a surprise for you that research in Norbotten started quite early, even before what you see here, before the beginning of the 20th century. And this is the uh, Jaure research station picture in 1905. So we see typical academic building, right? Sending people out there to doing research in the field. Actually, very similar to what we sometimes do still today. This was actually one of the first research stations until it burned down. But it was replaced very quickly with the Abbey School Scientific Station. And it might not sound like space, but geosciences were done very early in that time. The geomagnetic field pulsations were uh, discovered there and were researched there. And I know some geoscience colleagues are here and very happy about geosciences performed in Norbotten. So this is very good, very good support <laughs> for that. And more and more research topics were connected here in Norbotten that have a direct connection with space research. Of course, we use different tools today than 100 years ago, but Chalmers University did ionospheric and radio science research. Uh, Uppsala University looked into cosmic noise. Um, there was uh, research done by KTH in uh, geomagnetic measurements and uh, plasma physics and uh, by Stockholm University in glaciology. And of course, this has to do with our environment, and space is part of our environment. So this are, these are all important, very important elements. So this changed then, of course, later on, as I already mentioned, with the Abisko Scientific Research Station. And you see here a view how the Abisko Station looks today. And it's still a very important element of the research performed here in northern Sweden. Not only directly linked to space, but all the things where we use space as a tool be it climate change research, trying to understand our Arctic environment, understanding better how we influence this environment and how we can protect this environment much better than we already do. So the history continued. Uh, around the time of the Second World War, there were um, government appointed research groups that worked into geomagnetical, seismological and meteorological observations to try to understand the Arctic environment that influences so much what we're doing here. After the Second World War, there were, uh, was a build-up of research activity in radio physics and then later uh, a temporal geophysical observatory was built there in the area. And then finally in 1956, the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences decided to do more here on a permanent base in Norbotten. And you might have heard of the geophysical year in 1956-57. That was one of the triggers for the space activities, the first space activities we saw, because Sputnik 1, the first human-made object that went into space, into orbit around Earth, the first satellite, was built during the, the geophysical year, 1956-57, was launched on October 4, 1957. And of course, when I ask about who are the space players, I would probably get the usual answer. So who do you think are the big space players in the world uh, when it comes to space? What do you think? California, so in the US, yes, very good answer. So again, good answers, you get chocolate. Yes, other, other space players in the world, what would you think? China, yes, China becomes a very big space player now nowadays. Russia, Russia still is a very big space player, yes, from the very beginning, still on board. Spain, Canary Island, okay. Yes, there are really, really important research facilities there, and Spain plays a... And Spain, yes, that's a good reason to, to, that you want chocolate. But Spain is an important player in Europe when it comes to space activities. I'm sure you have seen your Spanish astronaut, Peter Duque. Very good, yes, Canary Island is a good place for that. So, but you might be surprised that Sweden is a space player from the very, very beginning. 1957, 
the Kiruna Geophysical Observatory was created and became part of the activities for the International Geophysical Year. So not only observing the effects that our space environment has on us, the aurora, but also, of course, participating in these activities with first satellites, building a ground station, receiving satellite data and signals and things like that. And it became also a part then of uh, cosmic noise research as well as uh, a world center for aurora films. So that said, Kiruna is a space place in Norbotten, and we will hear more about Kiruna. But let me first, it's almost 11.11, .11. Let's first go for a commercial break in my talk. And uh, I think it's important to advertise that today only, featuring Axel Hagermann, back from the Baltic Sea, about fabulous planetary science, here at Wettenskappensuis at 12 o'clock. So stay tuned, and right after this talk, you can listen to Axel Hagermann's talk, either here or if you're out there. And also important, another announcement at 1300 at 1 p.m., also today only, featuring Thomas Kuhn, back from Gotland, uh, about fabulous atmospheric physics, uh, kind of atmospheric physics review, uh, review, not review, might be also a review, and also here at Wettenskappen Suisse. So stay tuned out there if you want to continue with a very space-related morning or midday. So I brought in now the money for the talk, so very good. So Kiruna, the Kiruna Space Campus, and who of you was ever at the Kiruna Space Campus? Yes, wonderful. We have colleagues who were there, that's automatic, yes. Uh, very good, very good, very good. So we'll get some chocolate for you. <laughs> you were at the Space Campus. Right, absolutely, you visited us. You were at the Space Campus in Kiruna? When? Did you visit it? Uh, in, school. in school. Very good. So what is your, your memory of that? 62. 62. So really the early days. So the building more like what you see up there. Yes, absolutely. Very good. You should come again and visit. You might be surprised how different it looks. So the Kiruna Space Campus is part of the space activities in Kiruna. It's part of the space ecosystem that we have there. And it's an important part. And it's not only LTU. We are kind of in a good neighborhood. We have nice neighbors, our bigger and smaller siblings there. So everything started with the Swedish Institute of Space Physics, IRF, in 1957. And then more institutions uh, showed up there and the campus grew. The IceCut Association, together with other Nordic countries, operates their large antennas to study the atmosphere and uh, atmospheric effects. Umeå University came in 1994, and since 2000, see the picture here with a new campus building uh, of LTU, in 2000, Lulia University of Technology became part of the space campus, and since then performs space education, space research, and also collaborative work with industry and other partners there at the Kiruna Space Campus. And let me remind you, especially those of you who are not here, unfortunately, and out there, what we are doing there. Because uh, LTU is Sweden's Arctic and Sweden's university when it comes to the field of space. We have three programs out there, so a little advertising should be permitted about these programs, especially if you're out there and interested to come study with us. We can promise you a lot of things. Great academic environment, lots of snow, eight months of winter, great if you like winter sports and outdoor activities. But more important, the academic part. We have the famous joint master program in space science and technology, the Space Master program that we do together with partners all over Europe. See here in Finland, the United Kingdom, Czech Republic, in France. So you spend one year with us and then you go for one year out there to the other partners. And this is an incredible experience uh, when it comes to learn about how things are done differently in different European countries, the different academic environments, the, the influence meeting new people, making new friends there. So I think this is a really, really great experience. We also have an international master program in spacecraft design, focusing on all the things that you can put on a rocket and shoot into space. And of course, we have the national five-year program that starts in Lulia and then comes to Kiruna. 
When you think of the space campus, you might often maybe just think of one or two things. Maybe, ah, oh, yeah, I heard they built instruments there that go to Jupiter. That's actually the Institute for Space Physics. Or, yes, they have students that put payloads on sounding rockets, Rexos. But it's actually so, so much more that we are doing there. This is just an overview of all the laboratories and facilities we have there at LTU Space Campus. And it is an incredible range from space education on one side to planetary science, to atmospheric science, and dealing with topics like snow, and you will later hear about these two things in particular, to space propulsion, to talking about how spacecraft uh, are built and designed and operated, to actually testing all the things that you can build as a student and try out if they actually work. So very, very project-oriented education. And all the buttons and logos you see around, these are partners. This is in close collaborations with our neighbors, with industry. You see some of the projects named there, from small satellites to the reuse of space debris materials to building your own rockets. All of this can be done on the space campus. And of course, we are not alone. We might be remote, but we are not alone out there, because we have an incredibly large network of international partners. Uh, we have partners within the university, we have uh, partners within Sweden, and we have international partners all over the world at space agencies, industry, research organizations, or uh, governmental institutions of any kind. But it doesn't stop with the space campus. There is more in this ecosystem out there. And one important element is S-Range, the space center there that also for around 60 years now is launching rockets in balloons into near space, into the high atmosphere to study and perform technology demonstrations up there. And you see here a rocket launch at one of the launch sites at S-Range in summer. It looks even more beautiful in winter, I have to say. And this is a very versatile location. So from launching high-altitude balloons to launching sounding rockets with experiments to receiving data from satellites with the many ground stations they have there to now, very recently, testing rocket engines for rockets that very soon might take off from S-Range into space and bring satellites into orbit to technology demonstration of sustainable space technologies, reusable rockets, green propellants, to very soon launching satellites into space. All of this can be done at S-Range, and it's actually more than just this launch site, because you need a secure perimeter. You need a large area where nobody lives and where you securely can launch your rockets, and if something goes wrong, the debris or the stages can come down, and you see here S-Range is quite large, goes from Kiruna up to the Norwegian and almost the Finnish border, more than 5,000 square kilometers, twice the size of Luxembourg, but with much less people there, but many reindeers. So this is actually an incredible place, and we should not forget it is operating for a long time. So this is nothing new. This is not something somebody came up and looked over a grass field and say, oh, let's start a launch rocket here next year. And when I say next year, it's actually not so far in the future to get to space. So last fall, the Swedish government decided, after almost 60 years of launching rockets only into near space, suborbital, Sweden should become a launching state, a country that launches their own rockets with satellites on top into space. Very important, a very great decision. And this is how the new launch site, the Launch Complex 3, looks like. Um, operational probably end of 2022, with the first launches probably in that time frame or a little bit later. And just two weeks ago, this is how the construction site looked like. So this is a very recent picture where the integration building will rise and you see it's not one launch site, it's already three launch sites for different rockets from different industrial companies. So soon satellites will take off into space from Kiruna, from northern Sweden. So that is actually very, very exciting. I'm sure you read about that many other countries think about launching rockets into space, right? 
Uh, we talked about Spain and the Canary Islands. So there are ideas about launching rockets also from Spanish territory, preferably from islands, so that if something goes wrong, the stuff safely drops into the water. Uh, in Great Britain, there are many sites that are competing against each other to become a launch site. We have other places in Europe that want to do this and all over the world. It's actually so much, you need a list and a map. And it might become a little bit confusing, but this is a map from last month. These are all the existing launch sites. So, as you said, US, Russia, China. So. They all have their launch sites on the map, as you can see, the black dots, and all the yellow dots are proposed launch sites. And you see it's quite a few. Uh, some of the uh, proposed launch sites are for suborbital flights, especially commercial suborbital flights, we talk about that. And others actually are really full rocket launch sites where in future satellites should be launched into space. So why do we need so many launch sites now? Why do we need an increase? Because for many, many years after the end of the Cold War, we used to have a very steady rate of about 80 plus type launches, 80 to 90 launches a year, with about 100 plus payloads going into space, hundreds plus satellites into Earth orbit or further down. That that changed in recent years. And one of the reasons why this changed so dramatically has to do with one thing, the so-called small satellite revolution, the small set revolution. So the question is, why did this change? But the first question is, what is a small satellite? What is a small satellite? What do you think? How would you define a small satellite? You carry in the bag. That's actually very good. I like that. This is excellent. What would you think? The same, carry in the bag. A small satellite, other ideas? A like a shoebox, another nice comparison. Yes, 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 very good. So, what would you think? A cube? A cube? A by 10. by 10 by 10 by 10. Okay, the last chocolate for you. You're <laughs> giving too much away. <laughs> other ideas. So, what is a small satellite? What would you say? Okay, so like a little little PC, something like this. Yeah, why not? What would you think, a small satellite? Half a meter. Half a meter. Oh, yeah, we're coming close to, to certain sizes. I'm not asking here, you will spoil the questions. <laughs> so, small satellites are nothing new. Because, and most people don't realize that, it all started with small satellites. So when you're a member of the small satellite community and people say, oh, you are the guys that came up basically 20 years ago or so and you developed all these new tiny satellites that go into space, then we proudly always say as a community, no, it started with us. Because by definition, and you will see this, basically all first satellites were small satellites by today's definition. Sputnik 1, less than 100 kilogram, as you see, was a small satellite. Most first demonstrations being the first probe to another celestial body, to the moon, or being the first weather satellite, or the first communication satellite, or the first navigation satellites, they were all small satellites. And even commercial private satellites are nothing new. Here, Oscar 3 from 1965, 16 kilogram, the first commercial privately funded satellites, funded by amateur radio enthusiasts. They brought their money together, they asked somebody, a company, to build a satellite, and it was launched. So what are small satellites today? Well, internationally we have a classification. If it's more than 500 kilogram, we talk about medium and large satellites. So let's say over 500 kilogram medium satellites, and if it's more than one and a half tons, probably, then it's really a large satellite or what we call a big bird. Small satellites uh, are usually considered if they are less than 500 kilogram. 500 kilogram is actually a lot, so you don't want to put this into your, into your bag, right? But they are still considered small satellites because basically a 500 kilogram satellite can be about a meter by a meter by a meter size. 
and that is still considered a small satellite. And this is how it started, especially with the microsatellites between 10 and 100 kilogram. These were the first academic small satellites. Actually, we just celebrated 40 years of academic small satellites. 40 years ago, in October 1981, colleagues from Great Britain, under the lead of Sir, today Sir Martin Sweeting, at Surrey, University of Surrey, built USAT-1, University of Surrey Satellite 1, and launched it in 1981 into space. And it was a satellite with less than 50 kilograms. And that was great back in the days. Because remember, computers were bigger back then. So you basically had to load a PC and another PC in the computer. And the whole ground station were made up from two home computers, BBC Micro home computers, actually. So really, really enthusiastic and innovative days. What is more common today are the so-called nanosatellites. The satellites in the range of less than 10 kilograms and, of course, the Pico satellites. And we even have now other categories, femtosatellites, satellite of 100 grams. Would you believe that a satellite could be 100 grams small? Yeah? You're absolutely right. Why is that the case? Because you helped. May I take this for a moment? I'm not breaking it. Thank you. Because you all helped with it, thanks to your mobile phone. What you achieved as customers and the market you created over the last 20 years and more helped miniaturize small satellites. Because everything that is in a small satellite is in a mobile phone. Mobile phone has, an example, what is on board of a mobile phone? What do you have on a mobile phone? Everything? Everything, that's true. With the right apps, you can, you can manage your life with it, actually. So what's on board of a mobile phone? Batteries. Batteries, exactly. We have power supply. What is on board of a mobile phone? CPU, we have an onboard computer. Very good, very good. Batteries, CPU, onboard computer, excellent. What is on board of a mobile phone? Huh? Sorry? Communication. communication, we have a communication system. Very good. What else is on board? Yes. We have GPS, actually. Satellites helping us with a mobile phone, so we have guidance, navigation, and control. Do we have a payload on board of a mobile phone? Do we? What, what is it? Yeah. That's more the application side. So what is the payload? Exactly. We have an Earth observation payload in every mobile phone, a camera. So everything that is on a mobile phone, and we even have attitude control sensors on board, uh, we have a structure that we need for a satellite. Thank you very much. So everything that is on board of a mobile phone is basically on board of a satellite. That's, that's actually great. So some of these satellites became smaller and smaller, thanks to you and the miniaturization. And that makes space lower cost. So we as universities are now able to do what space agencies were able to do 30 years ago. And I think that's great. We can provide our students with this experience. And I think you mentioned this 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter thing. Yeah, surprisingly, I prepared something. I brought a 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter satellite with me. And we didn't even arrange the question before, so very good. Thank you for that. This is a so-called CubeSat, a one-unit CubeSat. This is a mock-up, a 3D-printed mock-up of our students' satellite called Aptas. It is a one-unit CubeSat, 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters and less than 1.3 kilogram mass. And you can launch this into space, it has a payload, a camera, and another more important payload, a calibration payload for IceCut 3D. So we support our colleagues next door in their efforts to build up their IceCut capabilities with uh, new antenna systems in the 21st century and all these large uh, resolution uh, research for the atmosphere and everything fits into a satellite that size. This is the real size. It's not growing anymore. It's not getting bigger. This is the exciting part and this is the part Sorry? Oh, that was my own echo. Okay, and this is the part of the small satellite revolution. So one thing I'd like you to take with you when after this talk is actually that you remember how small a satellite is. We are building with our Finnish colleagues together another satellite, the Quarkensat. So every time from now on, when you're in the kitchen in the morning and you take your orange juice and you have the 
you have the orange juice package in your hand, then you should remember from now on, oh, this is how big this uh, fancy LTU satellite is. So that's actually the message, or at least one of the messages you should take with you. So, how far can you get with a small satellite? Can you only get to the low Earth orbit? No. This is actually the exciting part. You can go to other places. Of course, into low Earth orbit, for many years, universities build satellites that go into low Earth orbit and do research, Earth observation, monitoring, fundamental research, experiments, technology demonstration. But the exciting part is now today that we have now the tools as universities that we can get beyond low Earth orbit. And that is actually the future. We are at the beginning of a decade of exploration again. You have read about it. People want to go back to the moon. People want to send probes to Mars, to asteroids, to comets. And you can even participate in that, in addition to the big probes, with small satellites. NASA demonstrated with a 6U satellite. So basically, six times the size of this. That is still very small. That's your shoebox, basically. Send it to Mars and help to land a lander on Mars just with two of these satellites at that size. MARCO was that mission uh, a few years ago at Mars. Uh, probably next year we will see a dozen of these nano satellites launched to the moon together with the first Artemis flight and NASA Space Launch System, as you see here in the adapter ring. Or, of course, with ESA missions and JAXA missions, there will be CubeSats that go to asteroids and comets. So, Let's come back at the very end to the question. How far is it from no button to space? So, actually all of you are kind of right. Because space is our environment. So it starts actually really where we are. But internationally, the official definition is a little bit different. It's actually very low. The official definition is actually 100 kilometers. So who was close? Somebody said uh, 30 kilometers. You said 30 kilometers. That's close. You said 200 kilometers. No? Who said 200? That was the other end. Very good. So the 100 kilometers in between. And that sounds a little bit artificial, but it isn't. So the other thing I hope you take with you is, why do we have a 100 kilometer van Karman line that defines where space begins? And as you might have seen or read in recent weeks, this is all about when you're a billionaire and want to go to space, you really want to go to space, so you pay your millions for a ticket that brings you above 100 kilometers. Professor van Karman in the 50s calculated that because he made a thought experiment to define where space begins. He thought about uh, the experiment or a thought experiment, if a plane flies higher and higher and higher, you still have to create lift. But of course, the atmosphere becomes thinner. So at some point, there's not enough atmosphere anymore to create lift, even if you fly faster and faster. And at some point, you're so fast that you reach orbital velocity. So you orbit the Earth like a rocket and not like a plane anymore. And he calculated that. And depending on the assumptions he made, good systems engineering, uh, based on the assumptions you made, he calculated that this is somewhere above 80 kilometers, maybe closer even to around 90 kilometers. And there is a value, and there is actually no exact barrier. You cannot fly up there, and there is a sign you are now entering space, so there's nothing floating around. But of course, for international easier procedures, the International uh, uh, Aviation uh, institution, association, defined 100 kilometer, that's a good number, easy to remember. If you're above 100 kilometer, you're in space. But actually, if you're above, below, you're actually close to it. So, how far is it from Norbotten to space? It's a very simple answer. It starts right here. And it starts on places like the Space Campus, it starts on places like S-Range, it starts on all the places where we do space research here on the main campus of LTU. But it reaches far beyond that and goes above 100 kilometers. And the official motto, and I like that very much when I came here as a new professor last year, was great ideas grow below zero, better below zero. And I always like to add in the last 12 months, and in space. Because I think this is also where great ideas grow better. So, thank you very much. 
One minute ahead of time. Thank you.